Hi, everyone. Welcome. We are going to get started in a minute here. Just waiting for everyone to join from the hold room. Recording. All right, Leslie, let's, let's go ahead and get started. All right, thanks. Um, good afternoon. I want to welcome you and thank you for joining the third in our series of webinars hosted by the Land and Water Conservation Fund Coalition, um, where we're breaking down LWCF by sub program throughout these last th few months. Um, and offering a window into the behind the scenes of project development, program specifics, and future opportunities for funding and partnering. Um, my name is Leslie Kane. I'm chair of the LWCF Coalition. And on behalf of the thousands of groups across the country in the coalition, I want to thank you all for joining today and also for all of your efforts on behalf of LWCF. Um, so I will kick us off today with a brief overview, as well as a few updates and current issues facing decision makers in Congress and the administration and how that's shaping our coalition's work and that of the agencies and partners. And then we'll also hear from folks um, that you're seeing on the screen uh, who are working on the ground in the states to shed some light on the great projects and best ways to engage in that process. Um, today, they include David Patton, Northwest Area Director of the Trust for Public Land, um, Eric Kulisade, Commissioner of New York State Parks, Kristen Sykes with the Appalachian Mountain Club, Melissa Cryan, Stateside Administrator in Massachusetts, and Karis Floyd, Park and Recreation Manager at Michigan DNR. Um, after that, the National Park Service team will discuss the ins and outs of their programs, um, including Joel Lynch, Chief of State and Local Park Assistance Programs, Elizabeth Fondrest, Branch Chief, Recreation Grants Programs, and Ginger Carter, Grants Management Specialist. Um, and then we'll have time for some Q&A hosted by Amy Haskell of the Appalachian Mountain Club and Alan Front of Conservation Pathways. Um, so let's get started. Um, <clears throat> oops, there we go. Um, first, I wanna cover a little bit of the highlights of what full funding means um, and, and on the look ahead. Um, that guarantee of consistent annual full funding provides certainty and the ability to plan ahead for states and local governments and also the ability to leverage those private matching dollars. And that's especially important um, for the programs that we're talking about today for state and local parks. Um, it's also important to note that LWCF is a diverse toolbox. There are 10 programs um, underneath the umbrella of LWCF. Um, and LWCF has uniquely gone to every corner of the country, every state, territory, congressional district, and 98% of counties. Um, in addition, among other things, uh, full funding will help support the administration's America the Beautiful initiative by conserving public and private lands and waters, working with federal, state, local, and tribal partners, and improve equitable, equitable access to the outdoors and climate resiliency across landscapes. You'll hear a lot today about collaboration and partnerships and that incredible amount of work that goes into protecting access to recreation at the state and local level and just a, a note that all of these projects are locally driven. Um, so let's move to that next slide. So uh, what you're gonna look at here is the framework that Congress laid out when it passed the Dingle Act and it chose those 10 programs that I talked about. Today we're focusing on two of those programs, the state and local assistance program, the traditional um, formula grant uh, that many of you know about from the original um, authorization of LWCF as well as uh, the Outdoor Recreation Legacy Partnership Program, which is a competitive grant program also run uh, by state and local assistance um, that goes to communities for, for urban park protection. Um, we've also got a circle around Go Mesa, which is an additional complementary funding source for state and local parks that's woven into that overall funding portfolio. So let's move to the next slide. So as many of you know, um, we, I, I wanna talk a little bit about the issues and opportunities facing decision makers. Um, now that LWCF is mandatory, uh, like Medicare and Medicaid, it is subjected to uh, sequestration 5.7% across the board cut to each program. So that's a total of $51 million uh, off the top of LWCF's 900 
um, which is putting a squeeze on all of those unmet needs in each of the programs across the country. And that's a shortfall we'd like to find a way to address going forward. Um, secondly, uh, on the highlights of, of things that, are, uh, that Congress is looking at, there's a reemergence of earmarks in Congress. Um, so there's an opportunity in the appropriations process for community funding. Um, the House and Senate bills did include a couple of those earmarks. Um, and though that is not a part of the programs we're discussing today, it does apply to five of the other programs is in a, and is a factor in the overall funding mix. Um, one really important priority for the coalition and our champions this year was to end the practice of rescissions. And that is moving old or unspent um, unused funding to other purposes. And what we favor instead is reprogramming those dollars back into the LWCF program for those many uh, growing unmet needs. And we're really, really happy to report that the appropriators supported that. There were 46 bipartisan senators who supported that as, long, as well as 192 bipartisan House members and neither the House nor Senate bill included any rescissions um, in LWCF. And that's so important because as I've mentioned, LWCF is oversubscribed, even with full funding. Um, one clear example of that was $190 million of supplemental federal agency and forest legacy projects that were submitted along with the FY22 budget. But that's just a fraction of that overall backlog of need throughout the country for all of the programs. Um, so we're working to address that shortfall due to sequestration as well as that pent up demand. Um, and it's worth noting that 900 million is a floor, not a ceiling. And in fact, last Congress, last year, Congress provided $919 million for the program. Um, some new highlights, uh, some of you may have seen that the Build Back Better bill includes an additional $100 million for urban parks funding, and that will complement those ORLP dollars um, if approved in the final bill. These funds will be separate and outside of the ORLP program, but will enhance and go towards um, addressing those outside needs. Um, the other update is the Outdoors for All Act, uh, which will codify the ORLP program. Um, and that was introduced in both the House and Senate about a month ago, um, again, in bipartisan fashion uh, with Congresswoman Barragon and Turner in the House and Senators Padilla and Collins in the Senate. So we're really excited about the progress on that front. Um, so let's go to the next slide and um, talk about a little bit about what you can do to help the effort. We can talk about this later on in this webinar, but um, I think one of the most important things to note is to sort of keep those, uh, highlighting those project successes. Um, tell the stories of how these dollars are impacting your communities. Um, reach out and work with your federal agency staff, with state partners, local partners, regional partners, and see how you can be helpful. Engage with the coalition. We will continue to be working on successful implementation. And we're here as a resource. We wanna know how, can, how we can be helpful to you and your work. Um, we have a project toolkit on our website that um, provides resources for each of the sub programs, including eligibility, grant applications, timelines, agency contact information, and much more. Um, so now I'm gonna pass this on to my distinguished colleagues who are working at the local level on projects for a window into that process and best how and how best to partner with them. And we'll start that panel with David Patton from TPL. David. Great, thank you, Leslie. Uh, and thank you for, for inviting me to present today to the coalition. Um, for those that don't know, the Trust for Public Land is uh, nearly 50 years old and we create parks to protect land for people ensuring healthy livable communities. Uh, and we've been doing it across the country, but um, uh, in Washington state, we've been active for almost that entire 50 years. And as we know, the stateside program is really important for preserving and developing outdoor recreation resources, including park trails and wildlife lands. In Washington state specifically, I've, uh, it's, pretty, it's a pretty special place in my opinion, not just because uh, I work here, uh, but because I think the program uh, really is complemented by some things that the state has put into place. And uh, two of those things I wanna just highlight are uh, a dedicated matching program uh, there's a program called the Washington Wildlife and Recreation Program. It was established in the late 80s, early 90s um, by some uh, bipartisan um, um, uh, advocates who really wanted to make sure that we were protecting the great places that we enjoy uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the natural beauty, for the parks, the trails, recreation. Uh, and so we, we established a program that um, uh, is funded at about $100 million every other, uh, we have a biennium, so every other year. And that uh, includes opportunities to match the stateside program. 
So uh, not only do we have great state programs, but it can help to, um, to secure and, and put to use the state side of Belusia. In addition, the way in which we select projects is, I think, pretty unique, but also, uh, again, a bipartisan uh, selection process. And it's essentially, you know, a, an application um, to the state. The state then reviews, has a uh, citizen advisory panel that um, uh, scores every project based on uh, different criteria. Uh, and then once that scoring is complete and approved, the projects are ranked, ranked order, so that um, what the funding will fund projects until the funding is run out. And there is no politics in play to, to move, move projects up or down the list. It's where you are on the list. If there's enough funding, your project gets selected. And if not, you, have, you can come back to the next session. So again, two really important components that make Washington, I think, a really successful um, uh, state for, for implementing uh, LBCF. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to talk specifically about a project that we completed recently, uh, just share um, share kind of how, how we did it and, uh, and of course, the, the importance of LWCF in making it happen. It's called the Kiwanis Metal Park. Uh, next slide, please. And so for those that um, know the state, uh, here it is. Uh, there's a town called Wenatchee. It's in north central Washington. Um, it's a place where the Trust for Public Land has been doing work for, for nearly 25 years. Uh, and really, really proud of our successes in protecting the foothills, creating trails and parks, uh, but also um, supporting the communities. Next slide, please. Um, so this part of the state is in the, the Columbia Plateau. It's a uh, it's, uh, high desert basin, um, and it's where many, much of our apples and cherries and other fruit come from. It's also a place that has um, a high, high amounts or, or uh, large populations of, of migrant and, and resident uh, workers. Who are uh, who are here working in the fields um, and and uh, working in the agricultural industry? Uh, next slide. So we were um, uh, we were invited in by the city to support um, the community of South Wenatchee, which is a primarily uh, um, working class community, um, Latin, oh, uh, and, and to help them. Oh, oh, someone's someone that can go on mute. Thank you so much. Um, and really help them uh, uh, renovate a local park that uh, was ID'd by the city, but they were, they were not uh, successful in, in really creating a design. So we, we were invited in to come uh, do our creative placemaking and park design and development uh, for this community. And one of the things that we recognized when we got there was that um, we were going to need some help. Um, it's, uh, it, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't that, that our work wasn't appreciated, it was that we really needed to understand um, the culture and the community at large. So we, we met these two fellows. Um, on the left is Terry Valdez, and on the right is Reverend uh, Perez, and both of them have great connections in the community. And, and we really leaned on them to, uh, to, to help us um, build relationships with, with the folks that live in this neighborhood. So next slide. And so from the start with those two, you know, our, our, our group of uh, community members and interested parties in this project grew um, uh, exponentially. And here's just a, a few of the pictures. And, th and through that process uh, and sitting down over, over, me over food, oftentimes potlucks, um, uh, talked about kind of the four issues that they felt they wanted to address. And you can see them on the screen here, neighborhood safety and opportunities for kids, uh, places for cultural and community events. Um, they really felt like they needed a stronger voice within the city. Uh, and help to really, uh, you know, address isolation, depression, and loneliness was, which was something that the community really um, felt was an issue. Next slide. Um, and so here's here's the park design itself, um, and you can see there's we made there's there's a lot of great elements here. A soccer pitch, which wasn't there previously. In the center is a kiosco, and for those that don't know, that's pretty traditional in parks in Mexico. Uh, it's like a bandstand where you can have cultural events and music and dancing. And that was really important to this community, making sure that we we're reflecting the culture uh, and the needs of, of the folks that live in this neighborhood. Um, uh, and then um, updating the other uh, features of the park. Uh, next next day, slide, please. Um, but what really was um, the, the biggest outcome from this project wasn't the redevelopment of the park itself. It was the engagement in the community. And in fact, um, through the process, uh, we actually helped form uh, a group called the Parque Padrinos, uh, which is uh, godfathers of, uh, of the park. And that's this group of 80 strong that came together. They helped us with creative placemaking. They helped us reach uh, deeper into the community to really understand the needs and the, and the desires and the goals. Uh, but also, they were a group that started to really care for the park in a way that maybe the community wasn't beforehand. So next step, uh, next slide, please. 
And this group really took it upon themselves to create a mission for themselves. And you can see here, improving community well-being, promoting art and local cultures, um, a sense of belonging, increased leadership and civic participation. This was the evolution of a conversation around how to change a park. And this group came together to see this, this opportunity to really become more cohesive as a, as a community. Next slide, please. Um, and they did things even before we, we had enough money to break ground. They were starting to do things in this park that really changed the, uh, the nature of, that, of the relationship between the park and the community. They were holding park activation events and programming. They were doing you know, um, uh, dances in the park. They were holding um, um, art, art shows and, and, and um, they're having uh, food trucks come to the park. And people were starting to engage in the park in a way that they hadn't previously. Next slide, please. They were holding festivals. They started to realize this is their this is their third place, so they started to hold festivals. Next slide, please. Um, uh, and and through this process, I think the Trust for Public Land really learned a lot of really important lessons, especially when working with um, with a diverse community such as this. And that is, you know, we really need to step back and listen and understand. Uh, and the investment in the people who live in the community is um, it will have amazing returns. Uh, we also recognize that the power of our brand, and this is true for most organizations that are on this call, really can move the move the needle. Um, if if we weren't there, their their voice, um, we were help, we were able to help amplify their voice, especially in this in uh, in in city hall where um, we we received I should say a uh, million dollars through uh, LWCF and stateside funding. We then had a fundraising campaign and we were about $800,000 short of our goal. And the group, the Parque Pedrinos, um, went to city council, uh, 45 strong, and advocated for the city to invest in that, that final gap. Um, and really, it was this group that got this project done. Um, and we were so proud of the fact that they were able to do that and able to transform the community. And now they're off doing uh, amazing things beyond just this park. The park has now been renovated. It's now open to the public. And now they're working on many other issues that are concerning the neighborhood. Uh, next, next slide, please. Oh, and then just just a couple of pictures of the renovated park. Um, top left is a new entrance area. Uh, art was a huge component to this park. Uh, we were able to get a, um, a, a National Endowment of the Arts grant to ensure that there was uh, lots of features. And then in this on the lower right here is the kiosco, and that's the the new bandstand that they're using for cultural events. Uh, so, so with that, I'll, I'll stop and uh, and hand the baton over to Eric. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, David. Looks like I'm, am I on mute? Can people hear me? Can you just wave and see if you can hear me? Okay, good. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Kulisade, uh, and I am the Commissioner of the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation. Uh, just a little bit of background, I guess. I've, I've been Commissioner for about three years, and uh, New York, obviously, is a big system. You know, with our, when our, just within our park system, we, New York splits up uh, sort of our environmental lands, our ecological lands from our parks. Uh, we have about 250 parks, 250 facilities that includes a whole lot of state parks, 35 historic sites, and then just a lot of other facilities and trails that we run. It's a big system, one of the biggest in the country is heavily, heavily capitalized, heavily, highly developed and very historic. Uh, and I would also just say that in terms of uh, the LWCF, LWCF stateside has made, has left an amazing mark and an amazing legacy uh, in, in New York State. And it continues to this day, and, and we look forward to pivoting it. And, and, and we love the fact that it's in this secure position for the future. You know, I think you can look at, um, obviously, you know, Virtually all of our parks or LWCF parks um, have, have been reflected uh, LWCF investments, uh, and, but it does, but it really, but we're just the beginning because you really have to look uh, to our partners in the state and there are hundreds of communities across New York that have uh, benefited from LWCF funding. So as a signaling and leadership program, there's no question it's been just phenomenally important for the last 50 some odd years that it's been in existence. And uh, it's just a critical a critical piece kind of of the year funding por portfolio and providing leadership and kind of uh, optics going forward. So I'm just gonna talk um, um, less detail than David, but I will talk really more about kind of our purposes and, and where we have, uh, been investing and some highlight a few projects where we've been investing 
our our funding, our LWCF funding in the last in the last ten years or so, and give a little sense of where we're going in the future. Uh, so if you can pull up uh, the next slide. Uh, so, and, and I should say, you know, statewide, statewide New York, our park system gets about gets $78 million, a, uh, sorry, 78 million visitors a year. Uh, and that's hit a high point. Uh, it's reflective of the investments that New York has been making on its own and with the federal government. So Allegheny State Park, um, one of our flagship parks, it's tucked into the southwestern corner of the state uh, near Pennsylvania on the Pennsylvania line. Uh, it is really... Uh, the Western New York sort of destination park. Uh, there are hundreds, hundreds of, of cabins, hundreds of cottages, hundreds of campsites. In the summer, you have you have really a camping resort here on the south on the south end on the, on the southern tier of New York State. Uh, we had a, a crumbling uh, bathhouse, a Quaker run. Uh, and we were able to, uh, over actually a couple of phases, you'll see that there's actually, often as we do this in New York, we'll put LWCF in more than once um, to the projects because there's always a need. Uh, we were able to totally refurbish this uh, bathhouse and comfort station uh, on Quaker Run Lake, which is again, one of the two main destinations in this really national park stature park for us. Um, really is a huge draw for kind of, um, you know, working class of Buffalo and those areas of Western New York. And, and the amazing thing about this park is just the generations of people you, you know, the, it just actually reached its 100th anniversary. And there's a whole video with testimonials from people who've been going to this park for generations. It's really, it, it makes your heart swell when you think about the love and passion for this park. Uh, next slide. Um, we also are, um, you know, we are distributed statewide. Obviously, uh, and diversity these days in New York is something that you find statewide, but we are always looking to make sure that we are providing uh, state-of-the-art facilities to all our customers. Um, and so this parcel, this, this project is an example of this. Um, and again, it's a, pro it's a project uh, that this, the overall uh, FDR pool has had, the pool complex has had more than one uh, shot of LWCF grants in it. Uh, uh, FDR Park is about 20 miles, 25 miles north of the Bronx, uh, right on the Taconic Parkway. It is a major destination, particularly on weekends. Uh, and, and we packed, this is a pool that has a capacity of, of, of 3,000 people. Uh, it, is, um, it is the largest pool uh, in our state park system, one of the largest pools in New York. Uh, and it is vitally important, and it was, but it was one of the, it was probably, I don't know, but it may very well have been an LWCF park well, pool when it opened in the 60s, uh, and it was a pool we were just spending enormous amounts to just keep going. It was leaking and all kinds of things, so we just, in the, over the past year, we just uh, reopened this summer after a total gut renovation over the winter, adding water features that you see here, adding a zero entry aspect to it, and it is one of those places, again, where, where on a weekend, you know, you're in the middle of Westchester County, but you are hearing lots of languages, people of all different creeds, colors, ethnicities. It's really an amazing place. Um, and LWCF has helped us to maintain this and keep it at a higher level. The pool is fantastic. I totally recommend uh, people go spend time if they get a chance. It's truly a great pool. I took a plunge on the first day it got open. Uh, next slide. Uh, we are also um, looking to do, uh, you know, we're thinking about the future, right? Um, New York State Parks, we own, we are the largest shoreline owner in the state of New York. We own 350 miles of shoreline uh, on, on our islands and on, on the Great Lakes and along our rivers and streams. And uh, we, uh, in particular, this is, Sunken Meadow is one, is sort of a, a Moses era um, Robert Moses, if you've heard of him, who was sort of the architect of, of many of the parks on, on, on Long Island. Uh, this is the North Shore of Long Island. It's a park in a suburban area, probably 30 miles from, from the Queens line. Uh, but I'll tell you, you go here on a weekend and it is um, very uh, heavily uh, Latinx um, and, and just pe people coming and enjoying this park. We have these very old parking lots uh, that were on there. They're just basically sheet flow into the sheet flow into the into the Long Island Sound. So we're, we're achieving both obviously visitor amenities in this project, but also 
um, also really handling, you know, reducing sheet flow into Long Island Sound. Long Island Sound obviously is a place that's very stressed by development on all on all sides of it, and this project by creating you know the uh, the retention basin on that upper upper left corner that you see, generally using permeable parking, reducing the reducing the permeable surfaces is now really a, a, a fantastic demonstration space. In addition to being much more pleasant to be for our patrons who uh, who love it and crowd into it on a weekend. Uh, the next one, next slide. Uh, Rockland Lake is also, we, we do have, we have a whole sort of set of pools sort of ringing New York City uh, and Rockland Lake, this is in Rockland County, also really just across the river from, from FDR. Um, again, one of those parks that, you know, on a weekend, it is, it is um, a line to get in, uh, you know, during COVID, it was crazy to try and manage it. Uh, it is, it is, it is rocking, it is pulsing, it is, it is a place of incredible vibrancy on a, on a summer weekend, obviously it gets a lot of local use during the week, but on weekends it is, it is filled with uh, Spanish speaking, all kind all kinds of languages, all kinds of people, it's a very, it's, it's a fantastic place, and here also, uh, using LWCF funds, we were able to totally overhaul this complex, all these pools are obviously uh, some of our most popular amenities are also probably the most uh, resource uh, intensive in our system. Uh, and so having LWCF able to help us keep these facilities at peak performance uh, is really great. And, and again, it's, 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 a pro, it's, a, it's a program and funding that, that we couldn't do without when we do these, these things. Uh, and then the next one, just next slide. So, you know, obviously LWCF um, is, we are, we are incredibly excited to see LWCF growing again for us. Um, you know, in the last 10 years, uh, New York has been, uh, we've been able to invest 36 and a half million in our in New York State Parks projects. Uh, we are, we, in the, we have, uh, as I said, a strong legacy of, of, of distributions to local projects as well. Communities across the state do it. Uh, when when the when those funding were at low levels, we kept those into the state. But now they're increasing again. We do expect to start putting funneling those out, distributing those through the grant program. We have a parallel grant program. LWC. The great thing about LWCF is also a very flexible program. It's worked well with our own grant program, and we see an opportunity as as it's now stabilized to sort of start incorporating into that program, distributing once again. So. And I think that the overall takeaway is LWCF is just a phenomenal, it's a phenomenal program for us. It's a phenomenal source of stability uh, and, and, and constancy and uh, just really excited to see the work of this coalition and, and getting it uh, put into uh, perpetual status. So thanks. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to my old friend and uh, my old friend from I think the Highlands Coalition, I think it was, uh, Kristen Sykes. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Eric. Uh, Kristen Sykes with the Appalachian Mountain Club. If you're not familiar, we're the oldest conservation and recreation organization in the country, founded in 1876 with the real goal of protecting lands, waters, and trails in the Northeast and uh, getting folks outside. I'm in lovely Holyoke, Massachusetts. Uh, behind me is the Holyoke Heritage State Park, which is uh, downtown and is a recipient of land and water conservation fund dollars um, and is a uh, a really great resource for the city. Um, so next slide. Uh, so as we know, and uh, many folks have been talking about, and I think has been um, a real silver lining of what we faced in the global pandemic is that so many folks have gotten into the outdoors, whether it's their local pocket park or trail, or um, a lot of folks in the Northeast uh, travel to some of our wonderful national parks up in Maine um, and New Hampshire. So we've seen so many uh, people getting outdoors, whether it's for contemplation, um, a screen break uh, from Zoom, or uh, being able to get some exercise. And uh, really, I think we're seeing the benefit of the historic investments from the Land and Water Conservation Fund, um, and really the opportunity that it poses, especially with passage of the Great American Outdoors Act, to increase uh, more places for people to be able to go. Um, as we all know, um, you know, parks really provide not only uh, the opportunity for folks to get outside in public health, but also uh, helping with climate change. Um, park can be dramatically cooler than those in so-called park deserts. An analysis of 14,000 cities and towns showed that nationwide areas with a 10 minute walk of a park are as, as much as six degrees cooler than areas beyond that range. 
And yet, unfortunately, um, and has really been brought to bear in the last few years, not everyone has equal access to the kinds of parks that lower temperatures and allow for safe social distancing. And um, a lot of data reveals that across the US, parks serving primarily non-white populations are half the size of parks that serve majority white populations in five times more crowded. You're hearing about how uh, utilized and successful the parks are um, in New York and Washington. Uh, additionally, uh, parks serving majority low income households are on average four times smaller and four times more crowded than parks that serve majority high income households. So a real opportunity to broaden and expand uh, parks in particular in urban communities. Next slide. And uh, a lot of this was codified by a pivotal report that was released in 2020 by uh, the Center for American Progress and the Hispanic Access Fund. And this really prompted me to uh, reach out to my uh, colleague who I'll introduce in a minute here, uh, Melissa Cryan, to say, uh, wow, I was uh, quite frankly surprised that 96% um, of non-white and low-income communities in Massachusetts were nature-deprived. Um, and really started to, to dig uh, deeper into that. Um, and so this report um, has been pretty influential in, I would say, in Massachusetts, which already had a goal of you know, trying to increase uh, access to nature to, to work even harder. And with the additional dollars from LWCF, um, we're hopefully gonna be able to do that. So next slide. So in Massachusetts, we do have some um, great, uh, categorization of communities uh, so that we're really aware of the status of a lot of the communities. And so um, one of the ways that we're able to look at our neighborhoods in Massachusetts is uh, environmental justice communities, which uh, was recently actually updated by um, some climate legislation that was passed earlier this year. But overall, environmental justice communities fall into the four uh, different criteria in Massachusetts. Um, an annual medial, medium household income, that's not more than 65% of uh, statewide annual income. And I know some communities in Springfield that we're looking at have a medium income, family income of $23,000 a year. Uh, minorities uh, comprise 40% of the population. 25% um, or more of households lack English language proficiency. Um, and, you know, so as we look at the Land and Water Conservation Fund projects, which have really made great progress in Massachusetts, um, and you can see some of these uh, bright uh, areas here, which are the LWCF projects, primarily in the Lower Connecticut River Valley, uh, where I am in Holyoke, Springfield, and Chicopee, um, and then in the uh, greater Boston area, there's a real opportunity to expand a lot land and water conservation funding. Uh, next slide, Melissa, or sorry, <laughs> Caleb. Um, so we uh, did a little bit more analysis looking at a couple different communities um, and how land and water historic projects have overlaid with environmental justice communities. So to my left, um, which is considered the Berkshires, uh, Lenox, uh, Pittsfield, which uh, includes a number of environmental justice communities has had two land and water projects, but uh, real opportunities. There's also been a lot of revitalization happening in that down to city center, including you know, really fantastic rail trails and being able to connect communities to open space. Um, and then as I was just speaking of uh, the lower Connecticut River Valley, you can see that uh, pretty much the whole city of Springfield uh, falls into environmental justice category um, and primarily some of the communities that run along the Connecticut River and um, are separated from the downtown by the highway system such as uh, 91 and 291. Um, really uh, have a deficit of nature. And really, quite frankly, sometimes it's a, a matter of a, a wall or a fence that uh, is a barrier for them to be able to get to uh, recreation opportunities or open space. Uh, next slide. Um, and similarly, moving to the Eastern part of the state, uh, if you look at uh, Everett and Chelsea, where there's a um, lot of environmental justice communities, there have been uh, some terrific LWCF projects, but again, um, so many more opportunities especially to try to connect uh, some of these already protected open space, whether it's by a trail or uh, to other parks. Um, and then uh, in the Somerville, Medford area, um, also, again, some really terrific projects, but it just shows um, how much wor more work that there is to be done um, in some of these communities. Next slide. So with the passage of the Great American Outdoors Act, um, I, I reached out to Melissa a few years ago um, and said, wow, you're gonna have a lot more money to spend in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, how can we make sure that that goes to uh, 
historically underserved and marginalized communities. Uh, so we've been um, talking a lot uh, to lots of different folks, uh, including with some of our colleagues from the Nature Conservancy. Um, and one thing that we've really found is that um, a lot of folks maybe knew about the Land and Water Conservation Fund, but were unfamiliar in particular with the stateside program of all the different ways in which it can be utilized and how it can also be used to leverage a lot of the other funds, especially some which we're seeing um, coming through Congress right now. So we hosted two statewide listening sessions, one with municipalities and regional planning agencies, and one with conservation, recreation, and environmental justice groups. And we're um, actually working on a toolkit of some of the challenges and opportunities that we learned. Um, we also presented to the Massachusetts Association of Conservation Commission Spring Conference and um, a lunch and learn. Melissa and I just did this lunch and learn recently. And while we may think that folks are a little bit zoomed out for lunchtime, we had 50 folks joining us, which we thought was uh, pretty great with lots of good questions. Um, and more and more, we're just learning that uh, folks aren't familiar with the Land and Water Conservation Fund and all the different things that it can do. Um, in the Connecticut River Valley here, we have the Silvio Conti Fish and Wildlife Refuge, which spans New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, and Connecticut, from New Hampshire all the way down to the Long Island Sound. And with the Friends of Conti, we coordinated an LWCF stateside funding webinar um, to talk with folks in New Hampshire, uh, Massachusetts, and Vermont about how they're utilizing these land and water funds. And as we're finding in a lot of these urban areas along the Connecticut River, those are some of the primary places where folks really don't even have access to the Connecticut River, which is a primary feature of the Connecticut River Valley. Um, we also had the opportunity, Melissa and I had to present to um, another National Park Service webinar. Um, and then we're actually working now on uh, presenting with some other state agency funders, including uh, the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation, as well as the Massachusetts Department of Transportation to see how we can best utilize all the different state funds that exist, whether it's our Mass Trails program, LWCF stateside, uh, complete streets uh, so that we can work on making sure that people have safe, protected bike lanes and public transit to get to open space. So we're really trying to not only take advantage of the additional money that we're getting through the Great American Outdoors Act and LWCF stateside, but also how do we leverage that with other funds and really truly make sure that folks uh, have the opportunity to get to some of these places that we've already protected and the places that we hope to protect in the future. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my wonderful partner and colleague, Melissa Cryan. Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, if we could get to the next slide there. Thank you so much, Caleb. Um, so uh, similar to Washington State, as uh, David had said, the uh, land and water program in Massachusetts is open to all municipalities that have an up-to-date open space and recreation plan, as well as our state agencies. So we don't discriminate only to our state agencies. We allow everyone to apply. And um, we also are similar in that we have a rating system and uh, go rank high to low and then draw the line where we run out of money. So we have for a number of years been considering DEI in our rating system and just um, some highlights from the uh, last rating system that was included in our SCORP in 2017. Uh, we're looking to implement, obviously, our SCORP included uh, in one of the goals of which is to increase parks and open space in diverse neighborhoods throughout the Commonwealth. We're also looking to provide access to environmental justice populations throughout the state. So we're looking to make sure that communities are um, looking to locate new resources or renovate um, existing parks in these EJ population areas within their communities. We're also looking to make sure that they're providing access for people with disabilities. So this means that they're not just going along with the ADA requirements, but they're going above and beyond what is required. We also like to see that communities are doing enhanced outreach to these populations um, in environmental justice neighborhoods. So as we like to uh, crib from a wonderful movie, we like to say if they build it, they will, uh, they will come, or if you build it, they will come to make sure that the amenities that are being built are actually the needs of the community members. And also we have project quality points that are discretionary points. And um, we do look to make sure that we are awarding more points for those projects that are reflective of the um, bullet points that are above. Next slide, please, Caleb. 
So now we're just going to run through some parks that have received land and water funding in the past few years that um, are reflective of being in environmental justice populations. So the city of Worcester has received two grants for Hadwin Park. One was to do some um, tot lot and basketball court improvements. And the second was to build out a fully accessible trail network. So this is um, the second largest city in the Commonwealth and in the heart of the state. So this is a really critical uh, network of trails that will provide access to uh, a, a walking air, uh, safe walking paths for people in an urban area. Next slide, please. One of my most, the, I, I shouldn't be biased, you shouldn't be selecting your, your favorite child out of your, your park projects, but I really commend the city of Springfield, which uh, Kristen had mentioned earlier. Uh, this is a very creative use of land and water uh, funding. So this is to, uh, the Ruth Elizabeth Park project. And as you can see here, it's part of a, an urban park network, a trail that's connecting uh, parks throughout the city it's connecting six parks and um, the trail network is on roads, but so the land and water uh, money isn't going to those specific Im uh, improvements on the roads, but instead is focused on improvements to just Ruth Elizabeth here. And as a part of this project, they came up with a similar signage that will go in all of these parks, highlighting the city's historical and cultural improvement or the legacy within the city. So you can see here a sample of the signage that is in Ruth Elizabeth Park specifically. Um, next slide, please. And another great park that was uh, recently completed with land and water funding is Pete's Park in Beverly, which is along the coastline in northeastern part of the state. Uh, many of you probably became familiar with Pete Frady's thanks to the Ice Bucket Challenge a few years ago. So Pete um, is from Beverly, Massachusetts, and the city was looking to make uh, some improvements to this park, which previously had horrible topography and was extremely inaccessible to anybody with any sort of mobility issues. So the city took the land and water funding and made it more accessible, created this, uh, this wonderful playground that is accessible to everybody. And as you can see here, the kids don't care that it is accessible to everybody. They're just having a great time. They also made, the city made an overlook space. Um, they also added an addition to this play space. They have a nature inspired play space. They added an outdoor classroom as well as a basketball court. Next slide. And also we're still working out with the park service, the final details on this ORLP project that we were selected for to move along to final, final approval. Um, but this is a really exciting project. This is uh, the Clippership Connector Project, which was awarded to, or we are crossing our fingers that it will be awarded to our state um, Department of Conservation and Recreation, which is our state parks agency in the Commonwealth. So where that little orange circle is in the middle of the slide is uh, the half mile long trail that will connect uh, to the Minuteman path to the north, which is actually uh, a land and water project itself down to the south trails that run through Somerville, Everett and Charlestown, which are also all environmental justice communities. And it abuts the trail more or less abuts um, I-93, which is the interstate that runs through Boston. And this will serve as a non um, vehicle way for people to access uh, Boston and get into the city for, um, for work using um, their feet or their bike. And we're looking forward to seeing that happen. The project was selected through a, a really rigorous public participation process that involved um, many, many members of the environmental justice community in the city of Medford, which you can see there, which abuts the highway. And with that, I look forward to hearing what Karis in Michigan has to say about the program. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's been going on at uh, Belle Isle Park here in Detroit, Michigan. 
And I want to start with a little, just a little bit of history. Um, Karis, you're currently muted. I thought I unmuted, sorry. I'll start over. Um, just wanna talk a little bit about Belle Isle Park and the uh, state of Michigan, give a little bit of history. Uh, the state uh, came on the scene in 2014 after an agreement with the state of Michigan and also with the city of Detroit. Uh, we had a beautiful park, uh, but 30 plus years, uh, the park really uh, didn't have anything uh, done uh, to the park. And so we were asked to come in and facilitate and and uh, do some investments and, and get the park up and running. Um, part of what we've done in the, pa in the past and also in the, the current future is um, we, we looked at the uh, city as a whole and the park as a whole and um, being that it's an urban park right on the Detroit River, uh, we had a lot of uh, needs here. We had approximately $300 million uh, in, in, in improvement needs, uh, repair needs. Uh, we were looking at the general uh, community and wanting to make sure that we could um, put together a park that would bring a uh, big diverse group of people back to Belle Isle. Uh, I grew up on the island, um, you know, so I thought this was a wonderful opportunity to, to really get involved, uh, to bring the park back uh, to where it once was. Uh, so one of the, the, the main things um, is we first had a lot of listening sessions with the community who wanted to find out what do you want? What do you want to see? Uh, and the community uh, told us what they wanted. Uh, they told us what they needed to see uh, as far as uh, the operation of Bell Isle and, and what we could bring back uh, for people to come out and enjoy again. And um, so as I go through my slides, I'll talk about some of the more important projects that we've been able to um, get with our LP. Uh, and some of the grants that we received uh, to help with some of the projects uh, within uh, Bell Isle. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll start with the athletic complex. Um, we had a, a complex that was just in uh, disarray. And so we were able to, um, with the old RLP grant, uh, they were so important with helping us to facilitate and getting the funding uh, for a matching grant uh, for the athletic complex. We had a baseball field that was just not usable. Uh, we had um, soccer fields, lacrosse fields, basketball courts, just not usable. So we received a $325,000 grant and then the state was able to match that grant. And then we received some additional private funding which brought it to over a million dollars for this project. So we were able to actually uh, reinvest, uh, bring the baseball diamond and softball fields back up to uh, usage. And now we've got uh, groups that are using the fields and uh, they're coming back to Belle Isle and it's, it's been a great sight to see. Uh, the soccer clubs and the lacrosse fields, again, uh, being heavily used, all have been restored. Um, we've got uh, leagues that have been formed and that are using uh, the um, complex. Uh, we also have a vendor in place now that's overseeing the complex uh, and they're able to rent and, and get a lot of groups back out there. Uh, ADA, that was one of the main areas that we wanted to make sure that we incorporated into the project uh, because a lot of, of Bell Isle uh, did not have ADA accessibility at a lot of locations. So uh, now at the athletic complex, it is completely and fully 
uh, ADA accessible. Um, we're working with the handball courts currently. Uh, we've got some uh, new roofing uh, that will be going in place, new courts, new painting. Uh, we've got, again, another strong league that uses the uh, racquetball courts uh, yearly with leagues. And so they've been pretty excited to see the work that's going to be done there. We have, uh, we've included new parking areas, uh, new accessible areas that will get you back to the basketball courts. Um, and, and so that's been a huge, huge uh, uh, improvement for that area. Uh, new lighting, LED lighting that's in place now for the baseball fields. And, and so they're able to have uh, night games. Uh, haven't been able to do that for many years. Um, and, um, you know, so we've been very, very pleased with the outcome of the project. We've got some work going on on the, uh, the building itself uh, with some new roofing and windows and things of that nature. So it's been a great project so far for us to uh, be involved with. Next slide, please. Now the uh, Ralph Wilson Jr. Trail uh, is part of a pretty huge project. Um, we uh, have half of the trail that's completed now. And as you know that you'll be able to start at Belle Isle and you'll be able to access the trail. And it's uh, right now there will be a six mile uh, loop here in Belle Isle and uh, it will connect to our unique cultural uh, features and amenities throughout the park. Uh, we will have different rest areas, benches uh, that will be applied uh, this spring. Um, this will be like the Southern Gateway uh, to the Iron Bell Trail. And um, just with half of the trail being built thus far, uh, we've had um, several people that are out using it. And uh, again, it was a huge um, investment with uh, uh, OR. LP in helping to not only gain the funds, but working with Ralph Wilson to have a donation. And uh, it's been a $5 million project uh, that we're excited about. The loop will encounter the entire area of Bell Isle Park. So you'll be able to actually uh, use the loop around the park, which will take people off of the roads because our traffic is so heavy. We've got over 5 million visitors that are using the park. And so we've got a lot of heavy vehicle traffic. And so now this will, it's a big safety feature. So that's a major plus. And then folks are able to ride a trail. And then if you wanna just continue on and, and hit some of the other spots that are going up to the UP, uh, you'll have that opportunity as well. So we are extremely excited about um, the Ralph Wilson Trail uh, being in place. Um, and I'll go back to, I want to go back and talk a little bit about um, with us assuming the responsibility of the park. Uh, like I said, we walked into Belle Isle and, and it had approximately $300 million in um, infrastructure needs and maintenance rest restoration that was needed. And uh, being that this is a national, uh, the park is on the National Registry for Historic Landscapes. Uh, we've been able to just go through and assess all of the uh, facilities, especially the Scott Fountain, uh, and looking at the number of people that just come to Belle Isle just to visit the Scott Fountain. So we've made some major uh, improvements and restorations in that area. We've been able to, um, with the community engagement, with uh, just with the Ralph Wilson Trail and the the athletic complex, we've been able to tie in with the neighborhoods. We've had a lot of uh, meetings with our uh, community engagement groups, and uh, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback on some of the projects that we're doing. And so, um, you know, it's been a, a, a really uh, fantastic trip to just watch the um, Bell Owl come back to where it once was. And, and not only where it once was, but a lot of the improvements that have been in place um, from this point. And next slide, please. 
I think that I think only has three slides, I believe. And I'd like to turn it over to our National Park Service now. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I'll uh, I'll go ahead and, and sort of kick us off. Uh, Ginger and I will be presenting. So, um, so just to kind of sum up, that was um, great to kind of get all the different um, some of the different aspects of the land and water program, um, both you know projects as well as sort of the planning and the thought that you know that goes into into the projects and. Um, I think what you probably observed is that you know that every state uh, does really have its own approach. Um, while there's you know some underlying you know common themes towards outdoor recreation, um, each state does uh, does have its own area of emphasis and priorities, and, and I think that was reflected in the um, in the projects you heard about today. Um, and there is um, some differences in how states use their funding. Um, some states do focus primarily on on state projects. Um, some only do local pass through. Uh, and some do a mix, and so that um, that is something variable. Though I will say that with the increasing funding that we have now, a lot of states are revisiting how um, how money gets used. And I'm sorry, I should have asked you, Caleb, to advance the slide. Um, and then, um, and there is also uh, depending on what uh, states are getting from their apportionment, the projects that you saw today um, range from about uh, the grants for what started about two hundred thousand and. Um, I think the local ones went up to 750, and then the state projects, um, you know, Eric shared those um, shared those values. But um, but there is a lot of variability in how much um, how much funding there is. I think last year the smallest grant we gave was twenty five thousand dollars, and the biggest was seven million. So there's sort of a very huge range in um, in what gets funded. Some projects are very sort of targeted towards a single element. Um, some projects are a whole revamp of parks, and and we we see we see all of it. Um, and I think that was reflected in the diversity of projects um, presented today. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, so how does that all work? So, um, so the program is administered, um, you know, by the Park Service in partnership with the states, and that's um, that's a really key piece. Um, every state has, um, by you know, in accord with the Land and Water Act, um, must have a designated state lead agency and a state liaison officer. So, um, so every state is. Um, has to have one agency that represents the program for that uh, for that state. Um, and then the second key requirement is that every state has to have a plan. Uh, Melissa talked a little bit about the statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan and what um, what Massachusetts has done. Um, they are required um, to maintain a plan at all times. They get updated about once every five years. Um, and and you know in addition to the grants, this is another way that um, partners can engage with the states. Um, there is supposed to be a public component to uh, to the score planning process. So um, a lot of them have you know work groups. I'm sorry, uh, steering groups, committees, things like that um, that get into um, that actually get into the state planning process with the with the states. Um, and then on the implementation side, obviously money. Um, so we talked about, or you heard about two different kinds of um, projects today. Um, most were um, grants that came through our traditional formula program. So these are um, projects that were selected by the states through state-based competitions using um, their apportionments um, uh, that come from the program. And then the second um, program is the ORLP, um, is our nationally competitive program. And so that was the last ones you heard about. Um, and those are sort of similar in that they start through a state selection, but then they come up to the national level um, for uh, a, a, merit, a national merit panel and then selection. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on as well. Um, and then the last piece of it um, is the land protection program components. And this is actually something that's also required by the act, which is that any um, site uh, that is assisted by land and water must be maintained for outdoor recreation permanently. So, um, so that's another consideration. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the state side, state side piece at least. So, um, so the funds are allocated to the states, um, also DC, and then the territories. So, you know, Puerto Rico, VI, um, Pacific territories, uh, by a formula that's laid out in the Act, um, with the three hundred and two million that we were um, allocated for the formula program last year, for example. Um, the apportionments range from 2.1 million uh, for the territories um, all the way up to about 25 million for California. Um, and so and then everyone else obviously kind of in between that. Um, but uh, most states at, the, at this funding level are sort of getting um, somewhere between five and $10 million. It probably is, is kind of the most common rate. 
Um, so once the states, um, either sort of before and after their apportionments, they, um, they have the lead on soliciting projects, which again can be from other state agencies, local governments, uh, depends on the state, um, which and those projects are competed. Um, and then, and they should be selected in accord with the state's plan. So, um, so every state uh, has, as part of their um, planning process does have, um, you know, scoring elements, and also talked a little bit about that as well, how Massachusetts selects. So every state will go through some kind of process like that to, um, to figure out what they're going to fund generally up to the funding that they have available. Um, and then once that selection is done, the applications are forwarded to the Park Service um, and we go through our own review process um, to sort of confirm the eligibility, you know, what the money is being requested for, um, things like that. And then we actually are the ones who um, establish the funding stream and, and release the grant to the state. Uh, I should mention that all um, grants go to the states um, and if there's a local applicant, the money is actually passed through to the, um, through the state as the, as the primary implement partner. Uh, next slide, please. And I think I turn it over to Jenner, who's going to talk a little bit more about ORLP. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if any of you can see me, but hopefully, yes. Elizabeth, you yeah. nod if you can hear me. Okay. Yep, we can. <laughs> Don't worry. All right. Um, so, ORLP is uh, part of the uh, state programs, but this is a competitive program. So, um, like the state program, uh, the states decide on what projects they are going to select to participate in the project and they do or in the program and they do that by running a competitive program um, and some states have a specific ORLAP competitive uh, program that they run some may select projects out of their regular uh, competitive process and some don't participate at all with ORLAP so uh, this is something you would have to contact your state and see what their uh, processes for um, getting into the uh, getting an application in for ORLAP. Um, so once the state uh, does their competition and decides the pro the projects that they feel best are suited for the ORLAP program, um, they submit them to the national competition um, that we run through Grants.gov, and then NPS takes those applications and we. Put together review panels to review both the technical side of the proposal and the merits uh, side of the proposal and these are ranked and scored um, and then we make final decisions and the uh, selected projects are invited to submit final applications for a full NPS review and determination of funding so what this means is this national competition is actually a pre-application process so if you are selected through the national competition, this doesn't guarantee that you're going to get funds. This just means that now you put together a full application package, which is much more involved than what our ORLAP application uh, is. And, um, and then you submit that to us and we do a full review and barring us finding any issues with it, then it goes on to be funded and uh, put into a grant. All right, next slide. Okay, so the ORLAP program funds basically the same things as the state uh, program does, except that it has a particular focus. And so the ORLAP program was meant to uh, support impactful projects uh, that are in urbanized areas uh, that create or substantially or substantially rehabilitate parks and other outdoor recreation sites that are within densely populated urban areas and are located in and serve low or lower income areas that are that significantly lack outdoor recreation source uh, resources. Um, and so these are projects that we want to see kind of being the jewels of your, your park projects. Uh, so these are not going to be uh, small rehab projects. If you're going to rehabilitate a park, you're basically going to be submitting something that is a complete rehab. It has to be, the project has to be the equal of a new park. Uh, the impact for the project should be equal of a new park. Um, and we look at, uh, well, we have qualifications to uh, how we determine what is a densely populated urban area. And that is in the application guidelines. Um, I don't wanna go into them now because they may switch a little bit for uh, the next competition, but 
it would be part of the funding opportunity that you can see uh, whenever you're applying. Um, and again, uh, I think uh, Elizabeth may have mentioned this, we're looking for projects that reconnect people with the outdoors. So, you know, we're not looking, um, well, like any LWF, LWCF project, uh, it cannot be focused on indoor activities. This does have to be an outdoor activity. And uh, for ORLAP, we also wanna see that the project is going to assist the, in, uh, the community or the neighborhood that it's in by creating new jobs or spurring economic development. All right, next slide. So for both formula and the ORLP grants, uh, there are activities that are permissible and those that are ineligible. And I don't think I need to read through these for you, but um, the permissible are basically what you would think, but there is land acquisition. Now, I don't know if anybody talked about acquisition much today, but uh, that is a possibility. Uh, but more importantly, to look at the ineligible, uh, because we do get projects that uh, involve like an indoor recreation center, which you associate with parks, but is not really outdoor recreation. Uh, so you wanna look at some of those types of issues that are ineligible. And if you have an idea uh, for a project and you want to send me an email and say, does this fit into what's eligible? I can certainly get back to you and we can discuss it. All right, now next slide. Okay, and uh, Elizabeth went over this a little bit. So whenever you receive funds through either the state program or the ORLP program uh, for a site, you are agreeing to put um, a protected boundary around the site. And you're saying that this place will never be converted to a non-recreational use. Um, and so, you're not looking just at the area of a park that you are doing the activity. So if you have a, a large park and you're just doing some work in one corner of it, that would not be your boundary. The boundary would be the entire park. So whatever you're doing, the, um, the outdoor recreation has to be a standalone unit. So it can be used as an outdoor recreation site if everything else around it goes away. Um, now there are times whenever you can't help the fact that there is a site that has to be used for something else. Um, and in those cases, uh, you would submit an, uh, a request uh, that has to be approved by the Secretary of Interior um, to replace that site with new recreation land that is, um, it says, of at least equal value and reasonably equivalent recreational use. Um, so, I think that's a pretty common activity. We have been giving grants since what, 1964? Is that correct? So um, there are a lot of um, what, the, what we call these conversions um, and you would work with our office in uh, finding this site and ensuring that it meets, um, it is equal to what is being lost. Uh, you are also agreeing that the site will be maintained and kept uh, accessible to the public for outdoor recreation in perpetuity. So it can never be put into pub or to private use. Um, and the sites are to be inspected by the state every few years to ensure that uh, the sites are being maintained. Uh, so there it says a five year inspection, deed notices, and funding acknowledgement signs are also required. So uh, funding acknowledgement sign is something that states that you receive money through the LWCF to um, develop the site. And it's a little way of promoting the program and letting the public know what LWCF does. All right, next slide. All right, uh, Elizabeth, did you want to take the last one? Uh, sure, and I'll, I'll just add in on that last slide that the state is a very important partner in the conversion. So, uh, so actually people go to the states uh, the states first and then before coming to the, the park service, but um, but there is a process. So anyway, but, um, but yeah, just to sort of circle back on my original point. Um, so working with the states is really key to all of this. So and if you're interested in learning about um, LD, more about LWCF in your state, um, you want to find the state lead agency for your state. And I have included the link to our website where we do actually have a contact list for each of the agencies. But 
Um, I'll note that you can also just Google your state name in LWCF and that probably would get you there just, to, just as fast. Um, and then the second thing is to take a look at your state score. So um, every state should have one and hopefully it is a current, uh, current plan to sort of begin to understand um, you know, what your state's priorities are and how, um, how do they implement uh, land and water in their state? What kinds of things do they want to fund? What kind of communities or efforts do they target? Um, that's the kind of thing you can hopefully garner from their plans. Um, and then finally, um, also it would be good to familiarize yourself with the state's application process. Again, not every state um, passes through money, but a lot of them, a lot of them do. Um, or sometimes when it's shared, it might be like an every other year thing or um, it's, uh, each state is a little bit different. So kind of understanding that part of the process early uh, will help you know, make sure that you're kind of ready when, um, you know, when you have a project or um, that you want to think about funding so you know when you might be able to compete for it compete for funding and just generally getting obviously to know your state, uh, your state partners um, and a lot of them, a lot of states besides, um, you know, sometimes it's a single, a single woman shop uh, like, uh, like Massachusetts, I think, for the most part, but um, a lot of states, um, some of the larger states like California, you know, have regional reps. Uh, a lot of states have that um, maybe represent land and water, but other, you know, other state or federal programs. Um, so uh, so often you can find that sort of information on the website, state's website as well as like who, who your contacts are. So I think that's it. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. And thanks to all of our panelists today. Um, I'm Amy Lindholm and uh, I'm not sure why my video is not coming up, but can everyone hear me? I can hear you and see you. Great. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to be facilitating the Q&A today. Um, and thanks so much to all of our panelists. This was really great information. Um, I was about to add, you know, as Melissa, uh, excuse me, as Elizabeth was describing, you know, resources for connecting with LWCF in your state. We also have a project toolkit on the LWCF Coalition website that we've built that goes through all of the different programs funded by the Land and Water Conservation Fund, including the State and Local Assistance Program, which we've been talking about today, and the Outdoor Recreation Legacy Partnership Program. Um, and that includes a lot of resources and, for, and information about uh, the kinds of things we've been talking about, what's eligible, what's not eligible, how to find the LWCF state office for your state. Um, <clears throat> so please check that out. Maybe Caleb can throw that in the chat for us. Um, to you know, to find more information and resources, and you know, we here at the coalition are also um, eager to be a resource for you. So um, please do um, contact us. My contact information will be sent uh, as part of a follow-up email from today's webinar, um, along with the recording. Uh, and we've been archiving all the recordings of this webinar series um, on the LWCF Coalition website as well. So we'll include a link to that. Um, <clears throat> in our follow-up note. Um, we had some good questions come in that I was hoping to uh, answer and I will go ahead and take a stab and then if any of our panelists wanna chime in um, with additional information, that's great. Um, <clears throat> we did have one question about um, federal side LWCF. Um, one, uh, one participant asked, uh, said we cooperatively manage a partnership um, with the a national wild and scenic river with the National Park Service. Um, and can we access NPS LWCF funds to support recreational access to the wild and scenic river and how? Um, and the answer to that I think is yes, um, probably not through the state and local assistance program, but through the federal side of LWCF, which is available to the Park Service um, to, to do conservation land acquisition within its borders. Um, <clears throat> so what you would wanna do similar to, uh, what we've been talking about today, you know, all of these projects start locally. Um, so with state and local assistance, it starts at the state level. Um, with federal side projects, it starts at the unit level. Um, so what you would want to do is uh, talk about this with you, the superintendent of that unit. National Wild and Scenic Rivers sometimes have their own superintendent or can be um, lumped in with other uh, into another larger unit of the National Park Service. Um, <clears throat> so those land managers are your first point of contact for anything you might be interested in doing 
um, if there's a willing seller and you want to add um, land there, if you want to add access points, that's something that um, would start at the unit level and then get passed up through the National Park Service um, to get on the you know national list of ranked projects. So <clears throat> as we've been going through this webinar series, we started actually with a session on National Park Service, uh, National Wildlife, uh, the, the Fish and Wildlife Service um, and BLM federal side projects. So you can find that session uh, again on our website archived. We did a session on federal conservation projects with those three agencies and then another one on forest conservation projects with the Forest Service and the Forest Legacy Program. Um, <clears throat> and then another question, actually a couple of questions, a couple of related questions came in about um, types of LWCF projects uh, at the state level. So how can nonprofit organizations access LWCF funds for rec access projects that are new, um, like trails or water access points, bridges, um, enhancements like river access point upgrades or ADA accessibility, um, rec access signage, uh, et cetera. Um, and then another person asked about motorized access on trails. Um, and these questions are specific to New Jersey, but really the answer is the same for all the states. And that, uh, and that is that you need to um, talk with your state about the State Comprehensive Outdoor Recreation Plan or the SCORP, as I think Elizabeth mentioned, and also Melissa from Massachusetts. Each state has a SCORP. Uh, they are updated every like five years. There's a public process for that. Um, so if the state is using LWCF funds um, in limited ways and you want to advocate for that to be broadened for, to other eligible uses, it sounds like uh, most of these things mentioned are eligible uses, except perhaps maintenance, um, clearing overgrown trails, perhaps not, but trail bridge replacement, perhaps. Um, seems like these are all good uses. Um, so if your state is not using its LWCF funds for things like that, then they need to hear from you. Um, <clears throat> so it's, you know, this is a, it seems like a dense process from the state agencies and the federal agencies, but really it's um, very much influenced by public participation. Um, so I encourage everybody to get involved in your state um, in the SCORE process and, and tell them what you want to see these funds used for. Yeah. Melissa, do you want to jump in? Thank you. I'm trying to unmute myself and lower my hand at the same time. Um, uh, yeah, and also just a side note too that while nonprofits are not eligible entities for the land and water program in Massachusetts, at least we have a very active land trust community in the state, and um, they are active partners with their local municipalities. So I would I don't know what the situation is like in New Jersey, but I would recommend that you reach out to your local municipality who would be an eligible entity and um, talk about partnering on a particular project there too. Great, thanks Melissa. Um, <clears throat> and someone also just asked in the Q&A about the project toolkit and there's a link now in the chat um, that Caleb posted for everybody. So um, you can find it there. And I will also make sure in our follow-up email that I link to that. Um, so that everyone has access to it, as well as to the multimedia page where we have archived all of the recordings of these webinar sessions. Um, so I think that's all for, of the questions that have been entered. They're, those are helpful questions, so thank you. Um, so I will close it out by just saying thank you again to all of our panelists today. Um, these are some really inspiring stories and you know, great examples from different states and different parts of the country. Um, so I hope it inspires folks to get involved um, and go out and use some of these funds for, for more great projects. Thanks so much.